There was a mighty nation, blessed above all of creation. It was a rare and precious pearl. Conceived in faith and liberty, home of the brave, land of the free. It was the envy of the world. But this shining city on a hill has turned from the Creator's will and let evil take control. Now the reckless men who lead them want to strip away their freedom and to steal their very souls. Now it's smoke and mirrors, switch and bait, criticize and confiscate and let the guilty walk away. In this once righteous, godly nation, in the halls of education, they forbid a child to pray. They say we need to spread the wealth. They pretend to guard the health of the feeble and the poor, while the hand they hold behind their back confuses and conceals the fact that the wolf is at the door. There's an unseen hand. Well, welcome to Tuesday morning, August 21st, Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. And really today, there really is a wolf at the door. And we are uh, going to be talking to- today about a program that was uh, uh, the introduction of the C- Canadian Gray Wolves. And I, it wasn't a reintroduction, it was an introduction of Canadian gray wolves into Yellowstone National Park in uh, 1994-95 and uh, how that has impacted the entire West as a result of that introduction. And we are going to be talking with uh, two guests. Uh, One is a a very familiar guest to Connecting the Dots with Dan Apple, and that is my uh, good friend Bob Fanning. And uh, Bob will be on with Dr. Valerius Geist, who is a real wolf expert. Uh, He is one of the top experts in the country on the issues of uh, wolves. And we are going to be talking about a program uh, being proposed and implemented in Colorado with the introduction of Canadian gray wolves into the Colorado landscape. Now, this is a state that has over 6 million people in the population, so this is called a settled landscape. And the presence and introduction of these large predators, these apex predators, into the state of Colorado will have an enormous impact on rural Colorado. And um, Bob knows this. Uh, we certainly talked about it a lot. But the fact is, uh, we are suffering a death by a thousand cuts. And wolves are only one of the blades being used to slice us to ribbons. Our republic is dying as a result of all the different programs from all the different special interests and deep state players who are taking away our liberty one step at a time. And they have literally eviscerated this country with all these crazy programs. And wolves are certainly a huge part of that. And it is a reason that the West is suffering and that the West is really uh, losing much, uh, much rural population uh, and we'll be losing a lot more. Farming and ranching in the West is suffering a, an enormous amount of issues that don't have anything to do with the life, liberty, and property uh, protection of the West. It has to do with all the special interests that are destroying our republic as we know it. So. Enough preaching. Uh, I want to get uh, to our guests immediately. Uh, Bob, are you on the call? I certainly am, Dan. All righty, good. And uh, Dr. Geist, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Oh, wonderful. Okay, we've got uh, a lot of ground to cover in the next two hours, so I don't want to 
dominate the discussion, but uh, Bob, you've uh, shared this with me, and this is something that was well known, is that Mike Phillips, uh, who is a Montana legislator and also um, the director of Ted Turner's, uh, one of his uh, wildlife groups, uh, made a statement in uh, Minneapolis uh, a number of years ago that the uh, introduction of the wolves was not uh, as much about the introduction of the wolves as it was about getting 30,000 ranchers off the uh, public land. So uh, maybe you can uh, expand on that a little bit? Yes. Uh, I was at a conference in Duluth, Minnesota, 600 attendants. Arlene and Bob Hansen is sat in the audience with me, and Mike Phillips is st stood up there and said to the audience of 600 that wolf introduction was uh, about driving 30,000 ranchers off of public lands. The, uh, the scientific uh, uh, bureaucrats from Yellowstone Park and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service were in the audience when Mike Phillips articulated that uh, that plan to steal the uh, uh, private property of ranchers on public lands without any plans for Fifth Amendment constitution, uh, constitutionally mandated restitution. Uh, and uh, I, I sat right behind the videographer when Phillips said this, which I, I perceive to be a, a criminal conspiracy to steal property, uh, it stated in front of the bureaucrats that were sp responsible for doing it. I uh, then went to the International Wolf Center and demanded a copy of the videotape, uh, and they uh, refused to give it to me, so I said I was going to go to the U.S. Attorney in Missoula and file criminal criminal charges against Mike Phillips. That's how serious I thought this to be, but it, it, it stayed in the public record. I made sure it would stay in the public record because uh, that was in 2000, February of 2000. I've been involved in this uh, 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 situation since August of 99 when I formed Friends of the Northern Yellowstone Elk Herd at my home with 37 attendees, uh, we had ultimately got uh, 3,700 members, and uh, I've devoted uh, the last 19 years at fighting this criminal conspiracy, or as I call it, wolf introduction is a criminal enterprise based on scientific fraud. And now the same kind of fraud is uh, being perpetrated on the people of Colorado. This animal has by no stretch of the imagination endangered or threatened, and uh, there's plenty of wolves on uh, planet Earth. The, the right. Endangered Species Act says that there has to be fewer than 7,000 members for, for it to even be considered. There are millions of wolves all over the world. So this is all subjective interpretation uh, of made-up phony baloney by bureaucrats and academics in search of larger bureaucracies and more money. Uh, all, most of these bureaucrats and academics are extreme left in their political leanings. So they believe that private property and ranchers uh, who who uh, raise cattle it should be driven from the landscape. So this is this is especially now. This is where uh, we have to to push back and push back hard, because as Dr. Geist will tell you, these animals carry a, a multiple of diseases. Jim Beers told us thirty diseases, and we're putting them right down where six million people live. In Montana, 47,000 square miles with 28 cities, 
we only have a million people, so the, the, the possibility for a real problem has grown by six sixfold. I'll, I'll turn it over to God, Dr. Geist now. Okay, and then uh, I just want to uh, I want to build on what we are going to be discussing here. I definitely want to get into the uh, uh, the issue of the uh, uh, Aconococcus granulosis uh, parasites, but I also I want to build on the overall fraud of this whole scheme because we had wolves in Yellowstone Park. Um, we've always had wolves in Yellowstone Park, but they were a smaller, uh, less aggressive species. I remember seeing wolves when I was a kid uh, in, in the Galton National Forest. Uh, it, it, but they were smaller and they were less aggressive. And the and fact that... Canis lupus irremotus. Yes, and, and, and we was inter- endangered. It, well, it was endangered, and the thing is, is we didn't do anything to improve it, and in fact, w- with the introduction of the larger, more aggressive species, they're, they're uh, pretty well driven out of their habitat now uh, because killed. of those were larger ones. Yeah. I, hired, yeah exactly. I hired Dr. Richard Mitchell, who wrote the list of endangered species, uh, when they in back in '73, when uh, this was proposed, and he, uh, the Dr. Richard Mitchell told an audience in January of 2000, when I brought him to Billings, Montana, that uh, the introduction of the larger Canis lupus uh, occidentalis from up near the Arctic Circle is. Uh, was a violation of the Endangered Species Act because the first thing that Canis lupus occidentalis did was kill off the remaining Canis lupus irremotus, which that was a violation of the Endangered Species Act. Go yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, we'll build on all this. Uh, Dr. Geist, I want to get you into the discussion because you are really, truly one of the uh, best wolf experts in the country. And the uh, Bob has given me a, uh, uh, a what's called a panel roundtable, a Canadian gray wolf introduction to Yellowstone, where you, uh, Bob, Will Graves, Bill Hoppy, and uh, uh, Dr. Delane Kritsky did a really excellent analysis of what was going on with this uh, introduction of gray wolves into Yellowstone and what a huge impact it was having on the landscape. And uh, so I'd, I'd like you to uh, start by maybe describing a little bit of your background, and then uh, and then we'll get into the discussion on this introduction in Colorado, because I know you were just down there. Uh, yes, Mr. Happel, but first of all, to clarify, I am really not a wolf expert. I'm an ungulate expert. That means I've been studying primarily the prey species that wolves are eating. That's where I've published most of my books and my papers and my uh, articles about. But mm-hmm. I did get into uh, wolves inadvertently because after taking uh, early retirement and coming to the uh, Vancouver Island, uh, we bought a very lovely little property, and all of a sudden, four years later, we were confronted by a pack of wolves. All right, ladies and gentlemen, sorry for the interruption there. We had a power surge here at the studio, in, uh, at the, and I'll hear on the micro effect, and it, it shut everything down in just a flash here, so we're just now getting fired back up. But uh, Dan, we should be back up and moving here. I'm sorry okay. for that. Uh, no, that's no problem. Uh, obviously, we've got an important show today, and uh, uh, it, it's amazing how many technical problems uh, those of us who are trying to deliver a message of truth seem to encounter. So, uh, Dr. Geis, we were right in the middle of the discussion. I know that you say you are really an expert on ungulates, but uh, I think uh, my comment is is we all become experts uh, through necessity, 
And as a uh, an expert on ungulates, obviously uh, the the predators and the problems that uh, the that they are facing is a result of certainly the introduction of these wolves. And so, uh, for that reason, I consider you a very renowned expert. So. Uh, with that, uh, go ahead and get back into the discussion and uh, and how you really got involved with the whole wolf introduction issue. <clears throat> well, as I was trying to say before the disruption happened, uh, there's a very important point that your audience should consider, and that is the following. Uh, your legislation demands that the wolf be spread throughout the settled landscape of the United States. And uh, the uh, reason for introducing the wolf uh, was, of course, primarily that this was a, an attempt to um, establish the wolf, to save the wolf, to conserve the wolf. The only trouble is that, of course, this is exactly the wrong thing to do. Because if you put the wolf into settled landscapes, you invariably introduce them to coyotes and wolves and to, and to the hybridization, so that in time, in long time, you're going to change this animal from the real wolf into a hybrid, a worthless hybrid, a koi dog. And as time goes on, it will become more and more dog and less and less and koi even. So this uh, whole program of introducing wolves here in the United States, as well as in Europe, is destined not to conserve the wolf, the real wolf, but to destroy the real wolf. So uh, <coughs> if you are... Uh, the excuse that all the suffering, all the that you're going to go through, all the losses that you're going to incur, all the pain that you're going to suffer is done for a worthy cause, namely the conservation of wolves, is false. This is not conservation. This is destruction, what you are doing. So, and we can then discuss uh, some details, but it's very important to know that this, what you are doing in the United States, is heading for failure. Okay. That, that is, uh, and, and that's certainly, I think, accepted by many of us who not only see the, uh, uh, the hybridization of the wolf as an issue, it's also the fact that uh, it is an apex predator who comes from much north of the United States originally, uh, was migrating into our country naturally, uh, just because they were expanding their territory, but uh, that there are also, as Bob says, probably many millions of wolves around the world, uh, and certainly we don't need to have uh, a, a different species in the United States from uh, what we originally had here. Now, I'm, I'm talking the continental United States. We recognize that Alaska has always had these large timber wolves uh, in, in their landscape. So, um, Bob, uh, I'd, I'd like you to maybe start this discussion with just how this uh, introduction occurred. And um, I know Jim Beers is um, um, a good friend of yours. I met Jim through you, but he was the one that uh, first um, exposed the fact that they used Pittman-Robertson funds uh, for the introduction of the wolves to Yellowstone Park. I'd, I'd like you to kind of explain that whole process and how, uh, really how illegal the whole process was in the very beginning. I'd be delighted. And I've spoken for you, Dan, on the, the, matter, the matters of finance, money and banking and economics. My expertise regarding wolves is considered to be political ecology. And I got started in 1999 on this project. And then by 2008, I flew down to Cheyenne, Wyoming, to a, a conference, land and water law conference by Ronnie and Chuck Sylvester. I uh, had never seen Jim in person, but met him there and asked him to come up to Montana, which he did in May of 2010. We put on a seminar, 
very well attended seminar, which I entitled "Wolves Are a uh, Wolf Introduction is a Criminal Enterprise Based on Scientific Fraud." Jim had uh, testified in the United States Congress before the uh, uh, Congressional Committee in charge of this sort of thing, and he brought in the old-fashioned uh, green and white candy-striped computer rooms. And Jim knew, because he was with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, knew what the codes on these computer runs uh, meant. And Jim was able to to uh, uh, demonstrate to Congress that 45 to $60 million was stolen by Jamie Rappaport Clark, who was the uh, director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, in order to, to give sportsmen's money the Pittman-Robertson, Dingle-Johnson excise taxes were looted from that trust and given to the NGOs, non-governmental organizations, to fund wolf introduction. It's about the money. That's my big message to the people of Colorado and the people of America right now follow the money this, this 45 to 60 million dollars was just the seed money to to enrich organizations like defenders of wildlife and the, the humane society of the united states and, and uh, earth justice the, the law arm of the center for biological diversity it was also the source of funds for grants. This this is a great big uh, bureaucratic, academic slush fund it, 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 under the the excuse of restoring natural balance. Right. And uh, the the uh, the elk herds were were turned into cash. Montana's northern Yellowstone elk herd had 20,000 members. 90% of it was wiped <coughs> out. And, and those animals were fed to wolves instead of people. And uh, the, the money was transferred to, the value of the elk herd was transferred to these organizations. Jamie Rappaport Clark left as the uh, uh, director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service went to the Defenders of Wildlife and was awarded a uh, three or four hundred thousand dollar salary for, for her role in stealing the 45 to 60 million dollars. And so what's going on down in California is just a continuum of the same criminal enterprise that's going to inflict all sorts of harm on the people of Colorado for no reason whatsoever. These animals are not endangered. Right. So the the the, the do-gooders, the people, the emotionally intoxicated urbanites who who see wolves licking Daryl Hannah or Doug Smith's face in a cage, they get all emotionally intoxicated. But the, the fact of the matter is that they are not doing any any good whatsoever, other than good for bureaucrats and academics in search of looting the system and getting grants mm -hmm. and, uh, and and more donations to their non-governmental organizations. No good is going to come from this. Yeah. No good is going to come from. No, you're right about that, Bob. And um, one of the uh, things that uh, the Pittman Robertson Fund, just so our listeners know, is uh, an excise tax on various sporting goods that is supposed to be used for the expansion of hunting and fishing opportunities 
uh, throughout the United States. And it was targeted as that. It is certainly not meant to be used for introduction of uh, large predators, apex predators, into the environment. Uh, they, they, I mean, that is the wildest stretch uh, of the imagination that you could that you could come up with. So, um, Dr. Geist, I want to um, have you talk about what the plans are for the uh, introduction of wolves into Colorado, the uh, Canadian gray wolves into Colorado. And then let's talk about some of the implications that are associated with that. Well, I, Mr. Happel, I can tell you as a Canadian, I uh, have kept my nose out of the political um, system in your country. And I'm only aware, of course, that uh, there is a plan to introduce wolves into Colorado. I'm aware of that. Uh, the trouble, of course, is that you don't have to introduce them. They're coming anyway. They are distributing themselves. The wolves are... Ex are have a very high reproductive rate, and wolves are expanding very quickly. To give you an example, outside the United States, for instance, the greatest wolf density in the world is found now in central Germany, in Saxony, and they're expanding at 30% a year. So, uh, as I said, the plan for reintroducing is one thing, but the reality is that you already have wolves coming into Colorado. Uh, there has been, of course, uh, the first finding of a moose with hydatid disease, which has caused some concern. And uh, uh, we do know from uh, excellent witnesses, in fact, by, uh, from individuals hired by the United Fish and, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, that these wolves do roam already in northern uh, Colorado. So that's nothing new. And uh, you're going to experience there exactly what has been experienced elsewhere, such as in Yellowstone Park, for instance, where you have a very severe decline in the elk herd from 20,000 down to about 4,000. And the only reason it is not <laughs> a greater decline is because the elk have left Yellowstone Park and have largely moved into uh, private ranches around the park in order to avoid the wolf. Uh, the... Um, um, you are facing, therefore, a very severe loss in wildlife, just as we have faced it here on Vancouver Island when the wolves began to expand in the 1970s, having island hopped from the mainland to Vancouver Island. And uh, we've lost, um, well, uh, again, about 90% of our deer. And the remaining deer that we have are all sitting in secure uh, locations, that is, in the cities and the suburbs and around farms. The deer hunting dropped from about 25,000 uh, deer killed a year to about 3,000 uh, being killed nowadays. And this is one of the things that you have to face. You're going to lose your hunting. And with losing your hunting, you're going to lose really your ability to administer uh, wildlife uh, as well. And on top of that, you are going to be faced with um, other consequences. Uh, such as the disease factor, which we are about to discuss, of course. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, uh, Dr. Geist, I, I know you're Canadian, but I, um, I, I want to remind our listeners that one of the consequences of uh, the decline in hunting is uh, a continued and a very increased uh, attack on our Second Amendment rights because Absolutely. Uh, they've convinced our... <laughs> Our uh, people in the United States that the Second Amendment is about hunting, and if there's no hunting, then we don't need a Second Amendment, according to uh, these uh, so-called experts. So, uh, with that, uh, let's talk a little bit about the migration of uh, the wolves into the area, because you know, with this, uh, supposedly we were going to have somewhere between uh, 35 and 50 pair of uh, Canadian gray wolves in Yellowstone Park, and they anticipated, uh, according to the experts and according to the NGOs that were promoting this stuff, that the ultimate number would be somewhere around 150 animals that would be in the park and they'd be isolated in the park. Well, obviously, they knew that was a phony number to begin with, and uh, wolves are just big dogs in, in one effect, and that is uh, they like to reproduce pups, and they like to uh, cover a lot of ground. 
Um, so obviously the the original uh, hypothesis was a totally false hypothesis. Uh, um, both of you gentlemen, I'd like to have you uh, weigh in on that. Well, yes, yes. you're absolutely right. right. The, uh, the original plan to introduce wolves in the Yellowstone Park, as we now know, was very, very deeply flawed. And uh, the, um, um, uh, the introduction has been touted as a great success. Well, this is very questionable because, first of all, you have uh, the um, uh, movement of elk outside the park. They are not contained inside the park, except for a relatively low number. And at the same time, you're not containing the wolves within the park, because as, as the uh, prey moves outside the park, the wolves will fo follow, and that's exactly what is happening. And of course, they are going to be uh, hunted uh, outside the park. Uh, this is being complained about, of course. But on top of that, you have the um, uh, virtual extermination of the uh, moose now in the park itself, so that what you're seeing uh, in Yellowstone is what we have seen in Banff National Park when I started uh, doing my work on mountain sheep in the 1960s, we had about 2,500 elk. We have now less than 300. On the top of that, these elk are hiding. Uh, the uh, rutting season is a silent rutting season now. The moose have also disappeared at the, um, at the present time. And uh, this is uh, an, uh, in Alberta, uh, where I used to uh, live, we have the wolves um, having such an impact on elk that they moved away from the forestry reserve again into the ranch country, and the moose did even better than that. They moved way beyond the ranch country into the prairies uh, to avoid uh, wolf predation. So you have a very, very severe impact by wolves on wildlife, and I'm very delighted, uh, Mr. Happel, that you mentioned the Second Amendment, because this is exactly what I have been also telling others that were uh, in favor of the wolf introduction, that you're going to lose your Second Amendment because it is basically hunting that maintains it, and this was uh, um, even true of, for instance, in communist countries, such as Mongolia. It was hunting that allowed the commoner to maintain firearms. And <coughs> no uh, wildlife to hunt, then you're going to very likely find that the opponents of the Second Amendment will win. So there's a very large uh, amount of American culture at stake. Yeah, the cornerstone anyway. of our culture is at stake because obviously uh, the right to self-defense is uh, inherent in in our Constitution, and uh, we'll lose that if we lose that Second Amendment. Bob, you weigh in on this, if you would, please. Uh, I'm going to go back to 1999 when we were recruiting members at uh, Friends of the Northern Yellowstone, Elkhart. We printed up a bumper sticker that said, a deal's a deal, wolf control now. This was 99. We, uh, we have Congress uh, who, uh, I went and got the original uh, book called Wolves for Yellowstone, and Congress said, do not hunt, hurt hunting, do not hurt ranching, and do not impact the already endangered grizzly bear. Before these people were able to do a wolf introduction, and so they had it. They had strict orders from Congress, and their reply back to Congress was that this introduction would be limited to ten packs of ten. Ten packs of ten has now turned into about eight thousand members, eight thousand wolves that have dispersed as far as Northern California, Oregon, Washington, Utah, and Colorado, and so th this thing has gone. Be way out of control and uh, beyond what they promised promised to uh, Congress. So I'd like your your listeners to remember three li three lines: regulatory capture, regulatory arbitrage, and regulatory takings. We've they captured the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They arbitraged our elk herds into cash for for NGOs and they they by regulation they have taken our elk herds as well as all of the uh, uncompensated bovine that have been killed been killed by uh, wolf predation 85% mm -hmm. 
of ungulate mortality, as pointed out to us by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, who studied for 50 years, 85% of ungulate mortality is due to predation. So what did they do? They introduced an animal that reproduces on a compound basis. Pretend it's a bond. It yields 33% a year. So these populations double every two or three years. And so this, this scourge is not only growing, but it's covering the entire country. And I call, I call wolf introduction, wolves a bioweapon introduced by the United Nations into the United States to destroy our custom, culture, and heritage, and our commerce. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not winging it on this, this uh, charge. In April of 2010, in The Economist magazine, the UNESCO bragged that they, that they put wolves into Yellowstone Park. Who was the woman in the ad from UNESCO? Her father ran the communist newspaper out of Romania, and she is a communist. Communists put wolves into Yellowstone Park. Make no mistake about it. This is a political agenda by the extreme left. Make no mistake about it. That mm -hmm. they are targeting our American cattle industry, gun ownership, and uh, they're trying to transfer our cattle industry to communist countries like Argentina. And right, so and, and is, private is, property is a, is a huge part of our, it's a cornerstone of what makes America different than the rest of the world. And if they destroy farming and ranching in rural America, small farms and ranches, uh, they will be taking, literally taking a huge bite out of any uh, concepts of private property. Uh, Mr. Happel, please note that in New Mexico, ranches with wolves have long ago become unsaleable. You know, those people that want to sell in order to their uh, property in order to retire cannot do so where wolves are present. And that's something that you may want to look into uh, more closely. Oh, absolutely. And, and I also know that uh, in New Mexico, many of the uh, rural school kids, they've now got uh, cages Shelter. where the uh, children have to wait for the bus or wait uh, after the bus drops them off for their parents to pick them up uh, because there are enough wolves in the area that it's become a huge health hazard. Yes, I I'm understand cages. that. I'm Our aware kids of are that. waiting in cages. Uh, may yeah. I have introduced another little thing here? After all, the, at the, on the surface, the introduction of wolves is being done because it is an attempt to restore nature. Right? The only trouble is that yes. you haven't had any natural landscapes for 12,000 years on this continent ever since the megafauna was destroyed when this continent was being settled and the landscape was made fit for human occupation. Now, one of the real winners of the extinction, uh, of the Pleistocene extinctions, is the wolf because it lost its natural enemies. And the reason why it has such an enormously high reproductive rate, the reason it is able to uh, spread and move about so widely is because in the past, in the, the Ice Ages, it was a very rare animal. It was not uh, in the archaeological, uh, pardon me, in the paleontological record. It is quite rare. <clears throat> and we know a little bit about that is uh, because we have uh, some in interesting studies going on in Manchuria where you can see that wherever the tiger exists, wolves virtually disappear. In other words, the wolf was formerly controlled by the large cat. It was a rare animal. And after these uh, large cats in North America died out, as well as the highly predaceous bears, such as the short-faced bear, wolves, of course, spread. And the only way they can be controlled is by, uh, by uh, human beings. So the wolf is not something natural. It is today something quite unnatural. It is here by very long historical consequences 
that uh, hark all the ways back to human beings. So that's the one, one point. The mm-hmm. wolf is Very not excellent a natural point, point, but it's, it's an unnatural one. I, I've got no, an that's an excellent point, that. Dr. Geist. And, and one of the things that uh, I think our listeners need to know that... Um, David Foreman, who was uh, the very radical left uh, founder of Earth First, is the really first really strong proponent of uh, reintroduction of apex predators into uh, the American uh, landscape. And uh, that is, it was considered at the time that it was even discussed as being a very radical concept. Well, uh, you have <coughs> another. Um, pardon me. <coughs> you have another factor to consider. You North Americans, or we North Americans, because this has been a joint effort between the United States and Canada, developed an absolutely um, radical uh, and highly, highly successful system of wildlife conservation. It was revolutionary. And this system of uh, wildlife conservation, when it was allowed to work, was and is a hands-on system of actual management, and it has returned um, species from the edge of extinction. It generated landscapes full of uh, wildlife and of very high biodiversity. In other words, it made landscape a very beautiful place to be in. (laughs) And at the same time, it is by law that you control the killing of wildlife, and it has to be done in a very humane (coughs) fashion. Whereas if you look at what is happening in areas that are under protectionism, such as your national parks, for instance, uh, the national parks are now complaining that they are losing biodiversity and uh, that uh, uh, they are suffering from an increase in invasive species. In other words, uh, animals that are sensitive uh, under protectionism die off, and the hoodlums, amongst the uh, plant and animal world have a wonderful time being totally protected. So you're losing uh, uh, biodiversity but also productivity of the landscape. You're also losing, of course, wildlife. And what little wildlife is left is then subject to predation. Now, death by predation is something that is extremely cruel. It is something that is drawn out. It's a very, very ugly thing to watch, to observe. So instead of having a landscape that is rich, and beautiful and full of life and uh, has a very high economic spin-off, you're getting a landscape that is impoverished and at the same time the animals are subjected to enormous cruelty. Excellent point. I coined a term term called biological desert. That's correct. And uh, I I did that after I spoke to Dr. Geist a, a long time ago. And Dr. Geist told me that Yellowstone Park would not only lose elk or buffalo but we'd lose our swan and our beavers and it would all be a sterilized landscape it's so this this is because of a, a law which i call the most draconian law on america's books which is the endangered species act allow me to illustrate we had a hundred thousand dollar fine attached to anybody who quote unquote took an endangered animal and so a rancher here in montana at that time ed bangs was the wolf project coordinator a rancher went out and uh, shot a wolf that was eating his uh, newborn uh, bovine calves and uh the uh uh, Ed Bangs went out to investigate, and I want the people to listen to this. Bangs turned to the rancher, and you know who was standing over his dead calves, and Ed Bangs said to the, the rancher, Ed Bangs, a government employee, said to the rancher, "If you breathe the word of this, I'll have your ranch." It is this sort of intimidation that the Endangered Species Act is enforced and imposed on the American people, and it is about the money. It is 100% about the money and power that uh, that this law is imposed on the American people. 
Now it's going to be imposed on six million people in Colorado, uh, and uh, this animal it is not only breeding at a 33 percent rate, but if it gets government protections, it's going to it's going to do get all sorts of bad habits. Go ahead, Doctor Geist. Well, uh, yeah. And then there is, of course, the disease problem, which is something we wanted to discuss uh, from the outset. Uh, but we should also know that uh, there is good information available about wolves at the international level and uh, on the website of the Wolf Education International. It's something that your viewers can look up. And we are attempting there to, uh, produce, to bring you uh, material that is valid, and we're bringing it in several languages because the problems that you face here in the United States are very similar to those faced in Europe at the present time. Uh, and uh, I'm involved, happen to be involved in both of uh, these uh, continents. Now, the, um, uh, one of the major reasons that I was uh, asked to participate was to speak about the Hadadi disease problem. And I, this is something that I spoke also two weeks ago, or 10 days ago, pardon me, in, uh, in, in Colorado. A Hadadi disease is a parasitic disease. It, is, um, it originates with the um, so-called wolf uh, or probably dog tapeworm, and there are two varieties of that uh, kind. There's the dog tapeworm and the fox tapeworm. One is the kind of coccus granulosus, the other one is the kind of coccus multilacularis. As it turns out, Professor Kritsky made a very good point that the a kind of coccus multilacularis is not a very dangerous um, parasitic disease at the present time, um, it has been a very uh, serious one in Europe, incidentally. Uh, but he made the point that uh, Echinococcus granulosus was a much, much greater threat. And he certainly is right about that one. Uh, the reason why this uh, plays a very important part in my own um, conception is because as a graduate student, we were introduced at the University of British Columbia by Professor James Adams uh, to the um, Hadadi disease. Uh, Professor Adams had been studying that for a good a long time. He um, was uh, moving about in the operation rooms of the Vancouver General Hospital, and he was able to record in gravid detail the um, absolutely horrendous images that come about when you open up a human being that is infected with Hadadi disease. Uh, the other important thing is being uh, associated with Professor Adams was that we heard, uh, we found out about the shop dog that was going on inside the operating rooms, something that you will not find in the uh, li uh, literature. And the reason why in the 1950s this disease was fairly prominent in British Columbia and northern Canada is because in those days, uh, trappers were still moving about the, uh, the landscape with uh, dog teams, and the skidoos were only starting to come on the, um, onto the scene. And as long as uh, trappers were having dog teams, they fed these dog teams the infected viscera from uh, moose primarily, but also from caribou and elk, and uh, that infected their dogs. And the dogs, in fact, in turn infected the landscape around them, and especially also the equipment, the harnesses, for instance. And so that these people wound up with Hadadi disease and then wound up in Vancouver General Hospital. And that is where he, uh, Adams was studying them. Now, I can assure you one thing, that the images of these uh, poor people on the operating table is something I will never forget in my whole life, because they're absolutely horrendous. And I'm very, very happy to say that Professor Kritsky, who was Professor Emeritus at Idaho State University, uh, made a very, very um, powerful statement when wolves were being introduced. He made that statement on February uh, 21st, 2010. And he said that uh, we should uh, be asking who, the U.S. government, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the wolf advocates will be paying for the health bills and the funeral expenses for those who will ultimately become infected as a result of wolf introductions into Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. Now, the way that this disease operates is as follows. The tapeworm, uh, the dog tapeworm, is a very small tapeworm, but there are hundreds and thousands of tapeworms in the gut of a wolf, 
And these tapeworms pass millions of eggs, and these eggs are mixed with the fecal matter and are put into the landscape by the wolf. Uh, the feces itself dries out, and the um, uh, eggs are very labile. They're, they uh, become airborne rather quickly, which is one reason why Professor Adams made the, uh, the point again and again and again that you, as wildlife biologists, for God's sake, do not poke around in the dry feces of wolves, because you're going to liberate a cloud of these fine eggs, and you will inhale some of this, and in your sputum you will swallow it, and you will become infected. In other words, it's very dangerous, in fact, to poke around in the uh, dry wolf feces, just as it is dangerous that if you have dried wolf feces on your lawn, as Scott Rockholm was uh, showing, uh, and you run your um, uh, lawn mover over top of it, you're going to scatter all these um, uh, bits and pieces uh, far and wide, and you create a cloud of um, eggs from this parasite. Or the same thing happens when you are combining uh, somewhere outside, and wolf feces is, is sitting on top of some of the cut uh, grass that you have, and you hit with, with the combine. Again, it splatters it uh, almost everywhere. So this is, and this is the the, the fact that uh, the eggs uh, are drifted about by the wind currents and so on around the dried feces was known in Europe and so the point was made that when you pick berries or pick mushrooms you should be actually looking out for wolf feces and get away from that as far as possible. Now what happens with these eggs? Normally these eggs rest on vegetation. Elk, deer come and feed on the vegetation the eggs hatch within the alimentary canal of uh, elk and deer, drill themselves through the walls of the gut, and are picked up by the bloodstream and are deposited in the first uh, capillary beds that they find, which is normally the liver. The second one is the lungs, and the third one is the brain. Uh, if uh, the uh, eggs manage to get to the brain and assist development in the brain, that's usually lethal. Um, otherwise, the... Um, eggs now begin to grow into cysts, and these cysts take a good long time to grow. It's about a 10-year uh, process, and they get larger and larger and larger. And in the, um, uh, in the deer and elk, of course, they grow a bit more quickly than that. They debilitate the elk and the deer, and the elk and deer then become prey of wolves again, and wolves come and eat the infected viscera and reinfect themselves again with the um, uh, tapeworm heads which are within the cyst. In other words, if you open up one of the cysts, you will find that they're full of little tiny, tiny um, yellow specks, and each yellow speck is the head of a tapeworm. And these settle, uh, attach themselves to the gut of the wolf and uh, produce eggs, and so the cycle is completed. Now, the real danger to us arises when that cycle jumps from the wolf to a dog in the house. A dog infected with um, I dare uh, tapeworms with, uh, is a lethal proposition. It's a very, very, very dangerous. And so um, uh, the question is, under what circumstances is it most likely that the disease will, for instance, be spread in Colorado, or for that matter, in Idaho and Wyoming? Uh, I have suggested uh, the following, and I've written this all up, and in fact, I presented that together with Dr. Helen Schwantje, who is the veterinarian responsible for wildlife matters in the province of British Columbia, we presented that to the Montana 